Now, I've always been very passionate with the cars I've owned. Uh, the Grand Prix was no exception. You guys have seen some of the stuff I've done. There's so much more that I've done that was before my YouTube days and all that stuff. So I've loved the car so much that even when I bought my new car, I just couldn't get rid of my Grand Prix. I've kept it around all this time. And I'm not alone in that either. So many Grand Prix owners that I know really do love their car. Even if they're starting to get faults or give issues, if you have like the the uh, the 97s to 04 to 03s or anything that have all the rust that are really showing up or you have engine issues, whatever. We're all very passionate about the cars. We really love the cars. We hold on to them. It is very much a community. But unfortunately, they are kind of getting up there in age, right? The cars did finish production in 2008. That means as of this video filming right now, they are the newest Grand Prix are 10 years old. And they just get older from there. So they are getting kind of up there. And uh, it may be time to start looking for a new car. So the question is, what car can you find that's comparable to the Grand Prix that'll give you a nice car to transition to. You'll still get some of that um, feeling and that vibe out of the get of the Grand Prix, but something a little newer. So what do we get? Well, this video, I'm gonna explore a few different uh, car options. I'll go through a little bit more in the details on what I did to get these, uh, these cars on my list. Um, so we'll go through all that. I'll kind of go through uh, the whole methodology behind it and everything. There's a couple things I do want to mention. First, I want to give a shout out to Glenn. Uh, he is uh, someone on my uh, channel and this was his video recommendation. Um, and I actually loved the idea of it. When he gave the recommendation, I thought, wow, this is actually a fantastic idea. What would we get next if we were getting rid of the Grand Prix? Um, so I actually divided it up into two videos. I'm going to do one on used cars. These are going to be covering from 2012 to 2014 and a certain price bracket. I'll go through those credentials in a second and then I'll be looking at new cars. That'll be a separate video. Also, the new car video will come a lot quicker. The used car video, um, I did try and go and uh, first try and obtain the cars privately just so I could test drive them so you can actually see them. Uh, this proved very difficult. Um, I also then contacted um, dozens, a dozen dealers in the in my area here in area in toronto here and um unless i was purchasing a car none of them wanted to give me the time of day even with the notion of promoting uh their dealership on my channel not a huge channel but thought hey why not but i also get it too right i know the sales business i know the car business i've been in uh, both so i do know that uh you know Time is money, so I can I get it, but it also made filming this video difficult because I couldn't obtain the cars I needed to show you. So there's a lot of early research that went on into uh, getting this, and a lot of things that went in, a lot of background stuff. Um, none of it all went in plan, so unfortunately I'm just gonna be kind of showing you pictures. So this is for used cars, 2012 to 2014. There was a few criteria I looked at. I looked at things like insurance costs, part costs, how easy it is to fix. Um, I looked at the styling of it, the roominess, the power. Um, you know, I looked at uh, lemon reports, uh, car complaints. I looked at all sorts of different things to find cars that are really reliable, that uh, have good power, comparable power. Um, insurance rates were good. Um, you know, anything that can fit in that criteria that when you're transitioning over, it's an easy transition to move over to another car. This is in conjunction with speaking with some Grand Prix owners just over the years, even just finding out what they like. We all like, you know, good space in our cars, good power, reliability, fuel economy, anything we can get out of the cars themselves that we can pull out of them we love. So I kind of looked at all those different things. Um, I looked at uh, how easy they were to fix. A lot of the Grand Prix owners I know are actually kind of do-it-yourselfers. So this was kind of uh, an important thing for me as well. So I kind of encompassed all of this in. I tied this all in with a uh, price point of about $20,000 Canadian or about 16,000 US. That's for the used cars. Um, I think uh, anything more than that for a car from 2012 to 2014 in the same category would be overpaying. So I kind of worked with that number. Um, and I also, again, one thing to point out, the insurance rates are, rates are based on uh, insurance in Toronto. And as we know, insurance is regional. So, you know, for example, if someone was to pay uh, $200 Canadian in uh, Toronto, they may pay $220 in Brampton, Ontario, or they may pay only $130 out in uh, Barrie, Ontario, and that's just in this main area here, and it's the same thing in the U.S., right, where you live, theft rates, um, claims, all this sort of stuff all plays a part, so I've, I've based it off of, of here, but it could vary. Um, so based on all this information here, I think you've got a gist of where I was going with it, well, where I'm going to come up with the list. I had about 40 cars 
And I did cut it down initially to about 10, but I'm kind of cheating. I threw a couple extra in there and I'll tell you why in a bit. But uh, yeah, but now I think you got an idea of it. I'm gonna move on. Now it's just gonna be, you're not gonna see my face anymore. You're just gonna see pictures. Let's get right to it, shall we? The first car on the list is, is here because it's an easy one to transition to. The Impala was the only double body left on the market after the cancellation of the Grand Prix, which happened in 2008. Um, and all others, including the Monte Carlo and uh, the first generation of the Buick LaCrosse slash Buick Allure, which changed over in 2009. But the Impala, it went on for five more years in consumer form, form after that, and another three years in fleet form. So even after the new Impala came out in 2014, it was still available for fleet for rentals, things like that. So the W body actually lived on for quite a bit longer. It's mostly identical mechanically from a suspension and chassis perspective. And uh, even with the changes they made over the years, it was still close enough. Eventually, they did get rid of the 3.8 liter that we so much love, uh, just to make way for newer engines. Um, and even those engines were eventually dropped for a 3.6 liter in 2012, uh, which is kind of a um, engine that's still around and still used today in many forms and fashions of GM vehicles. It makes 300 horsepower and 262 foot pounds of torque at the time. Um, it's got tons of room, and uh, it was the as far as I know, it's the actual only. W body available with a bench seat option in the front. So it was actually a six seater as an option. Um, and along with the good engine and a decent transmission made it a good drive. Um, from a re research perspective, uh, the lowest overall purchase cost of any cars on the list, just because it tends to not hold its value as well, but that also makes it a great value. It's a low theft, low incident vehicle. So insurance rates are very low. And operational costs are down too, um, with some of the regular maintenance parts lower than many other cars. This is probably due to the fact that it was W body is an aging platform. The only downside to the car, in my uh, opinion, is that the styling just wasn't up to par, even when it was running concurrently with the uh, with the Grand Prix, um, and even in LTZ form. I mean, it's a decent looking car, but by no means is it going to uh, turn heads or anything like that. It just kind of kind of bland if I may be honest it doesn't have that la it lacks that kind of um oomph and uh pizzazz the Grand Prix has um but even with that it's still a worthy purchase and one to consider now I'm cheating here since car number two is really just an extension of car number one it's still a Chevy Impala but we're talking about the 2014 and the reason I'm included it kind of separately is because the, it, the 2014 needs its own spot uh, since this car is such a far departure from the pre previous generation car, I said screw it, and let's include it as a separate, separate entry. Um, so with that, it's really number two, but it's it's really number one as well. So it is a second car that I've added in, but uh, you know it's 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 debatable. Um, I do think it's one of the best alternatives for a Grand Prix owner to get a newer, roomy, well-built, versatile car with modern architecture and design. Uh, the four-cylinder is a very serviceable engine. It makes just under 200 horsepower. But the 305 horsepower V6, which is the same 3.6 liter V6 that went in the 2012 and 2013 Impalas, um, and also, as mentioned before, seen in many other GM cars, that is the way to go for me. It offers ample power and very good fuel economy. Uh, there is also great looking, it's also a great looking car and tons of room inside. Uh, it comes with a lot of standard and optional amenities. Um, with lots of trims and packages available. So uh, finding one out there in, in used car form, finding a version you want seems to be pretty easy. There's lots of, lots. they sold pretty well, so there's lots out there. Uh, there is a couple of issues though. Uh, one, the Impala name went from being a revered nameplate to a bit of a stodgy one, which, you know, even when you look at the last one we talked about, the 2012-2013, it was a bit of an improvement. But if you look at the generations just before that, they did kind of um, ruin the Impala nameplate. Um, that's, you know, mainly in the 90s, early 2000s. Uh, it's a problem. The car is still having problems shaking off up to now. Also, because it did the 2014, it does have one of the higher overall purchase costs on the list. And the operating costs for standard parts like suspension, uh, tune-up parts, things like that, is a bit higher when you compare it to other cars. Um, even when you look at some of the cars that are included on this list, some of them being luxury, luxury cars, you'll see that in a bit. Um, but its insurance rates were very reasonable, uh, pretty much on par with the 2013 and 2012 models, which is surprising considering the departure in platform. 
but uh, it's also good because that car had actually pretty pretty good insurance rates are pretty low so you're still looking at that if you get this car here so with all that in mind it's definitely a car to pursue the Infiniti G37 is actually an excellent addition to this list um, but it does come at a bit of a cost and that's quite literal but I'll get to that in a bit but first, it, the car itself is worth mentioning as it's built on a solid platform and the engine option is very powerful and reliable overall. Um, I know I've heard different things about the 3.7 liter, which is the only engine available, but it's used across so many cars in uh, Nissan and Infiniti's range. Um, and overall, when you look at those cars, the engine holds up. You know, it's everything, using everything from the 370Z slash Fairlady Z to SUVs like the QX70. Um, to of course even in this car so it's a very common engine it does have different power ranges depending on the application and this car here makes 330 horsepower uh, which is more than enough to go and more than you found even in the, um, the top end Grand Prix or anything like that uh, it comes loaded with a lot of amenities options there's different body styles like if you want for example a coupe um, it, although Grand Prix, you know, you know, we're really looking at sedans in the last generation. Um, you know, they did have coupes in the uh, the series before, the 97 Sto 3s. So, um, you know, if you want a coupe option, it's there. And there's even all-wheel drive and a manual transmission, something I really wish was in the Grand Prix, the manual transmission, all-wheel drive, mm, take it or leave it, but I wish the manual transmissions were there. Um, but like I said, the car does come with higher costs. It has the highest insurance of any car on this list, any car, and that's by at least 10% more. It also has one of the higher purchase costs overall when you look comparing other cars to the list. So it's not the top, but it's pretty close to the top as far as buying. Um, it was relatively cost effective to maintain, uh, surprisingly so. So parts were actually pretty cheap. Um, and I do wonder if this has to do with the fact that a lot of the parts may be shared across Nissan and Infiniti's parts bin. But, uh, you know, it actually wasn't that bad to get uh, parts and it's fairly affordable. Um, also, it is worth noting that this is one of the smaller cars interior wise on the list. Um, and the seats are pretty comfortable in them, um, but it is still kind of um, a little more cramped compared to what may, Grand Prix owners may be used to. Um, but it's still an overall fun car to drive and uh, I think it would be a good car to consider. The Regal is a plate that's existed for, uh, for quite some time now. Um, it actually was a W body at one point, um, you know, way back about 15, 20 years ago or so. Um, but uh, right now we're looking at the fifth generation, which is the current one, the 2012s to 2014s. Um, it's actually built on a solid platform, the Epsilon 2, which is a very good GM platform overall. And it has a, lots of options, a lot of variety of engines and a lot of trims. Um, this is listed as a mid-sized car, and they have, again, all these different engines, but I wasn't a fan of some of the engines. Some of them just don't seem to match up to the power you used to in a Grand Prix. Um, you know, you probably get used to them. Um, you know, the, the smaller four cylinders actually all work okay. They're very, very fuel efficient. Um, but if you want something that's going to give you the same oomph, if you want something with a little more horsepower, something like the turbocharged 2.0, uh, which is really the preferred engine, or even the 2.4 liter is also very good. Um, now, as you know, I haven't really got a chance to test drive these cars, but this car I actually do have experience with. I have some experience with the Impalas, and I have experience with this car. Kind of a different form, though. I did a European trip last year, and I was in the UK, and I rented a Vauxhall Insignia, which is the same car. And although the engine was different, it is a fleet car. Uh, it was very comfortable, well-equipped, uh, drove really well, hauled us all around. It was It was a great car, and I was not disappointed at all. Um, there, you know, there is obviously differences. That was right-hand drive versus here, North America's left-hand drive. You know, the engines will be different, but still, um, you know, it was still a very solid car. And and what's good here is that you have a lot of trim and amenities to choose from. Um, it also has some of the best overall costs. It has the cheapest insurance of any car on the list. Yeah, that's right, the cheapest insurance, um, and one of the cheapest overall purchase costs of any car as well. Um, Getting parts is also very cost effective, uh, making it very easy to operate and maintain the car. Um, so you can look that if you're buying something like this, it's tied in with the, the smaller engines. Um, even if you get one of the lower power ones, you know, it's going to be a very easy car to maintain and very cheap overall. Uh, that being said, it is one of the smaller cars on the list. Um, and it had one of the smallest overall interior volumes, so it is going to be like a little bit tighter than uh, what you're used to in your Grand Prix, but not much, not by much. It was actually uh, fairly comfortable. Um, 
also it's not a volume seller buick has been trying to shake off that uh golden years image that it kind of has that, that that came up actually with the the re, the w body regals and everything like that and even before so it hasn't sold as much so finding a car with the the trim that you want and the options that you want and everything may be a little trickier but if you can it is a car definitely worth having to be honest the mazda 6 is the least my least favorite car in the list i'm not a mazda fan um i'm not own a mazda but i've had some bad experiences both with the cars and dealerships and with their cars i mean with other people i know um but that being said i can't ignore some of the merits of the mazda 6 um you know, when we when I was running through everything, it's proved to be a very reliable car from people who own it. It doesn't have a lot of issues at all, and that alone was a spark for me. Um, if you can, it's going to be very hard to find, but if you're looking at the 2012 to 2014, the 3.7 liter V6 uh, that's made by Ford, actually, and it makes 270 horsepower, 270 foot-pounds of torque, that's the engine to get, but that is so rare. It's so hard to find. Um and it was it doesn't help that it was dropped in 2013 so if you're looking at the 2014 model you're going to be out of luck there but that said it does have its kind of engine that's a standard which is a 2.5 liter um and although it only makes a 775 horsepower it's still peppy enough and it goes the car is not incredibly heavy or anything like that and it does have very good fuel economy and uh it does have a sporty manual transmission to go with it so that really does help as well um the auto is good as well, but uh, you know if you know how to drive manual, it, it, it does pair well even with the 2.5 liter engine. Again, manual is something I wish the Grand Prix had had as a stock option. Um, the, the exterior looks very nice and it has some angular lines. If you kind of look at it, maybe even kind of squint, there is a little bit of reminiscence of a Grand Prix there. The way kind of the headlights kind of, you know, angle over and cut around when you compare it to the Grand Prix. Um, you know, the shape of it the the rakes in the front and rear windshield sort of reminiscent of it um i'm not a huge fan of the interior um uh, as far as a styling perspective but uh it does have a lot of room a uh, very good room actually so you know that is a going uh, plus for it and the cost to operate is very very good it's excellent actually um getting common parts is slightly below average compared to the, everything else on the list and um the overall purchase price is second lowest only to the impala and the insurance rates is also second lowest only to the regal so that makes it actually a very good value overall when you compare it to everything else on the list um and because of the lower purchase costs it is possible to buy a higher spec model like the Grand Tour, for actually a very good price. It's very easy to find uh, lots of uh, purchase availability and different trims that are available to buy used. Um, and with that, what you do kind of lose in the interior design and the power you make up in other areas, um, again, in the operating costs and things like that. So for that, it definitely had to make the list. Oh, the Lexus ES 350 is a big, beautiful car. Tons of room, very, very quiet. And it's got that potent 3.5 liter, 274 horsepower, uh, 270 horsepower engine. Well, 268 to be specific, but I'm rounding here. Come on. Uh, the styling inside now looks very, very sharp. Um, it's a great looking car overall. And although many don't like it, I'm, I actually like the spindle grill. Um, even the new ones where it's getting even more outrageous. I actually am kind of a fan and I know some people are not, but hey, that's just me. On the 2012 to 2014 ES, it's not nearly as pronounced, that spindle grill. So if you get that, it's uh, it's still more manageable. It's uh, in 2015 and up, it kind of became this more exaggerated form. So you're still kind of safe if that kind of bothers you. Um, and honestly, you're getting Toyota reliability out of it. I mean, it's technically based off the Avalon platform, which is in a way also based off the Camry platform. But those cars have long proven they're very, very reliable. Um, I've spoken to a few people who have, like I said, I haven't got a chance to really drive the cars myself, but I know a few people who do, including a neighbor, actually, and uh, it's an amazing car to drive. They really do love it. It's proven to be very reliable. Um, there is a few problems with choosing this car, though, and that's uh, all comes down to price. Um, it is one of the most expensive cars on the list, ranking near the top overall. And it had really, really high insurance compared, air rates compared to other cars. Not the top, but uh, it was uh, kind of surprising. Um, 
actually, in fact, it's really only the second in the insurance rates, um, only with the G37 being at the top. So that kind of gives you an idea of that if you buy this car, you're probably looking, at, depending on what you're driving, where you're living, could be a little hike up in your insurance. Um, luckily, and maybe just due just to the fact that it could be a shared platform, overall part cost actually seems to be pretty low compared to other cars. Um, definitely not the lowest, but cheaper than many. Um, even cheaper than something like the 2014 Impala. Um, so that makes it actually a very easy car to operate overall and maintain over time. Um, but, you know, your initial buy-in could be a little higher. Um, you really can't go wrong with the car, though. Um, it's great car overall, and there's... and no knock to the Grand Prix or anything like that. We love our Grand Prix, but this is kind of a step up in the luxury game. So, of course, if you look into this, you are going to be moving up into a little bit more luxury for sure. Nothing wrong with that. The Nissan Max is another big car to make this list, and it's the second Nissan product to be on this list behind the Infiniti G37. What makes it interesting is the comparisons between just these two cars, not even just comparing between the Grand Prix and this, but these two cars, because they're kind of the same and different in at the same time they both have similar horsepower ratings 290 horsepower in the maxima and uh the g37 as i mentioned before 330 horsepower but they use different engines the maxima uses the older 3.5 liter uh, whereas the g37 uses the newer 3.7 liter um Parts cost, although parts are technically different, different suspension, different brakes. They're all actually very, very similar in price. Um, and again, I believe this has something to do with some of the platform sharing across Maximas, um, some of the Infinities, uh, Ultimas, things like that. Um, they also have very similar purchase costs with Infinity, just a couple hundred bucks more, just a couple hundred, not even much. So even for in the 2012 to 2014 range, um, you know, the price is very similar. However, you do get a lot more room in the Maxima than you would in the G37. I think that's part of the trade-off. Um, the insurance is also a little bit cheaper as well. Um, of course, Infinity being the top on the, the uh, most expensive insurance, the Maxima is a little bit lower. Um, it also has its own merits to go off as well that you know we should talk about. Um, I do know that when you people drive by, even now in the Maxima, it does draw a lot of attention. It's got this kind of um, long snout up front. Um, and this kind of longer sloping look to it. So it's got a, it really kind of draws you in when you look at it. Um, and the Maxima nameplate's been around for years. So people know the car and they know what it is. They know it's reliable. It's comfortable. Um, so really the only reason you'd ever consider, let's say, even the Infinity over this car is because you do get a sportier ride out of it in handling and obviously a bit more power out of it. But, uh, you know, mm -hmm. with that also comes its own costs as well if you happen to get uh, something like the Infinity versus the Maxima. Uh, but if you want a big, comfortable cruiser with excellent power as well, a lot of room and cheaper overall costs, then honestly, you can't go uh, wrong with the Maxima, even with its uh, CVT transmission. <laughs> the Lincoln is a mixed bag, and just mentioning it will be will make some wonder about the, this list, but it has a lot of good reasons to be on here. I know the front end can be a little off-putting for some with that long wing-like grills that's uh, been a weird design choice amongst Lincolns itself, but it does grow on you, and I think it works really good on this car compared to some of the other Lincolns. And I do like the rear end, which has this sort of retro futuristic vibe. The entire car is solid and reliable, and there is more than enough room for a Grand Prix owner. It's very affordable to buy, and has one of the best insurance rates overall, near the top actually. It has the cheapest overall common part cost. That's right, most of its parts were cheaper than every other car on this list. It comes with front wheel drive or all wheel drive, a solid 3.7 liter V6 with 300 horsepower, or even a hybrid option for the environment, environmentally friendly uh, driver. And so what's not to like? Well, one of the things is of course the brand. Uh, Lincoln has that golden years brand awareness to it, um, which I dare say is actually far worse than Buick's reputation. Um, and so it is often thought of as an older person's car, even when they're doing what they can to shake that image. So you'll have to contend with that, that explanation frequently. You're driving a Lincoln, really? But if that's all you have to deal with, well, then I think the pros outweigh the cons. Well, I've said it a couple times already, but it does really, it really does apply here too. Um, the Buick is a Golden Years brand, and that right off the bat, because I just said it already, that's the big issue with the LaCrosse, right? 
um, is that they're trying to shake that brand image of being older cars for retirees, things like that. And I think they've done a really good job with their cars. But once that image is ingrained, it's very hard to shake out. The Regal, as I mentioned before, is an excellent choice. But the Lacrosse is one to consider for sure. And um, if I'll be honest, if someone put a Regal and the Lacrosse in front of me, I think I'd be picking the Lacrosse. Um, it has a big, powerful V6, the same 305 horsepower unit found in the uh, 2014 Impala. It has all-wheel drive option if that's what you're looking for, especially, you know, living in uh, in Canada, having all-wheel drive in the winter. It's not bad. It's loaded, very smooth. Um, it's everything you want in a Grand Prix replacement. And it's great to look at inside and out, in my opinion. Um, it does have some odd quirks, uh, quirks in it. And that, uh, for example, one thing that's surprising to me, when even when you compare to other cars on this list, it has a small trunk, a noticeably small trunk. Um, almost... <laughs> annoyingly small for a car its size um it's definitely smaller than grand prix trunk for sure which is kind of weird to me but uh you know other than that i mean it's got a couple of small design flaws here and there and, and it's set up but all those things are very easy to overlook probably the biggest thing that did sting out, st stand out to me was the trunk um but on the other hand to that it is very affordable to purchase insurance rates are very very low common part costs little bit higher than average but still within the realm of affordability um and i believe that again that's all platform sharing as we talked about before so the more uh one of the benefits the downsides to platform sharing is what we saw with gms and fords and stuff in the 90s where you got cars that were the exact same just a different bra badge on it now we're actually seeing cars that look vastly different um but may have the same underpinnings so you're getting an exclusive a car that's not the same exact car but also you get kind of the benefits of the uh, the cheaper parts bin, right? Um, the only other problem I had with this car when I was doing the research is that the um, it seemed to be very hard to find. Again, and this is coming back to, I think, Buick's not being volume, as big volume sellers. I don't know. It could vary by area, but I, I did search throughout uh, the province of Ontario, and I did find it. Um, compared to other, car, the other cars in this anyways, it just wasn't as many options available to purchase and then that also means because you're buying used finding the trim you want or anything could also be tricky um but you know aside from that i think it's a great car good mileage and uh you know you wouldn't be with this at all all right this is the big boy of the bunch and the biggest engine in the bunch but all we're talking about here is the 2012 to 2014 chrysler 300 c the one and only c that's it um, I want to make sure I point that out right off the bat. The reason for this is when I was doing a lot of the research, I found very few issues uh, issues with the uh, V8 Chrysler 300s. Um, actually, not many other than um, you know a couple common things, maybe like suspension issues, things like that. When I was doing uh, common car complaints and lemon reports and so on, but the 3.6 liter uh, Pentastar V6, which is actually one of their flagship engines. Um, actually came back with a lot of complaints, a lot, and so much so that I couldn't really recommend the lower models. Um, I would feel like I'm almost telling you get a car that could have a potential issue, especially if you don't know how people have driven the car previously. So for that, I'm only saying the 300C only. Um, it does astonish me though how you can have two trims of the same car and have vastly different reliability levels. Um, so to kind of elaborate further, we are looking at the 5.7 liter V8 from the C, which makes 363 horsepower and 389 foot pound feet of torque. <laughs> More than enough. Um, it does have love it or hate its, hate its stylings. Um, I know a lot of people have either really gravitate toward the car or just hate the ostentatiousness of it. Um, but it does have huge stance and presence no matter what. And um, it does kind of co come off a little over large at times, especially if you're trying to park it, like, for example, downtown areas, things like that. But hey, that's okay. It's still very manageable. Um, in the C form, it does have a nice stance with huge wheels and a large body sitting on them. Uh, and it kind of sits low and snug to the ground uh, compared to, for example, just like a base model or something like that. So it is nice to look at. Um, and it also has an all-wheel drive option to go with it as well. So, hey, if you can find all-wheel drive, you can have V8 power and all-wheel drive. Nothing wrong with that. It is a bit harder to find, though. I did only find fewer models in all-wheel drive than I did in rear-wheel drive. I think overall, the 300 is a very good replacement car. Um, 
it's one because it sits near the top of the range of of all the cars in the list, but also in Chrysler's range as well. So, um, but because of that, do you expect to pay top end pricing, right? Um, it, its purchase cost was the second highest overall, only behind the Lexus. Um, and again, because there you can get a Chrysler 300 much cheaper, but I don't want to recommend those because of the six cylinders. Again, because of the V8, it is kind of higher. Um, also with that comes a, a higher insurance rate a rate and uh, maintenance costs are higher as well. Definitely not the highest on the list, but near the top for everything. Um, but you are looking at a big V8, um, which does have kind of um, not the greatest fuel economy numbers here, let's be honest, um, especially in a real world setting. I know they have projected real uh, pretty decent numbers, but in real world settings, it doesn't come out to the same thing. Um, one good thing that I like, and this is something I know Grand Prix owners, um, that at least I talk to, do like, is that they want to be able to modify their car. Either you leave it stock or you modify the hell out of it. And I will tell you that the 300 does have a lot of modification options, which are really nice. I'm sure you've seen them. Almost everyone modifies something, whether it be just the grill, the lights, something. So you buy the car and you'll have lots of uh, modification options to go with as well. So that's also a bonus for me. Um, on top of that, it does come with a lot of factory upgrades too. So, um, you know, there's a good chance that even buying the car, um, although kind of rare to find, um, you know, you're probably going to get one that has some good trim and, and options going with it. So, hey, you may be paying a little bit more, but you're getting a lot of power and a lot of room out of the car. You really can't beat German engineering, can you? Um, there were a couple choices when I was going through this. There was quite a few German cars that made the list, but ultimately I decided on the CC. Uh... I like its swooping rake of the front and rear windshield. It very much reminds me of a Grand Prix. And it's got that kind of swept back front end going with it and a rounded rear. Uh, rear. And uh, it's got a fairly wide track. All these things are reminiscent of uh, of uh, Grand Prix for me. And almost like, a, almost in a way, it's like a, if the Germans had built a Grand Prix, this is what it probably would look like. For this, along with some of its other merits, it made the list. Um, it did receive a refresh in 2012. Um, so for the 2013 model year, uh, so the front end, the, so the front and rear ends do look slightly different, um, for the 2012 versus 2013 and 2014. Um, but not a huge change, but just know that there is, uh, the car is still same thing, same platform, otherwise same engines, just, uh, you know, uh, slight, uh, visual changes happened in 2013. Um, it has a very efficient 2.0 TSI engine that makes 210 horsepower. Or if you're lucky enough to find it, it's unfortunately very rare, a 3.6 liter with 295 horsepower. Um, even with that, the cars are still very rare on the list. I mean, no no matter if you get the four-cylinder or the six-cylinder, um, they didn't sell in high numbers, high volume. And that's why they're actually being uh, canceled out. I think the new ones are called the Arteon or something like that. Don't quote me on it, but it is, it is a newer... Uh, version of the CC that's coming out, different name, different size, different styling, um, but it's par partially because these didn't sell in high volume. So finding one is very hard. Finding one the V6 even harder. Um, but it also means that if you happen to get one, it is very rare on the road, and people will look at it. It is a kind of an eye-catching car in a kind of a subtle way, but you don't see many of them on there. Um, Adding to some of the engine options that we have here, there is also a front wheel drive, which is standard. Of course, there's actually an all wheel drive. And my favorite, as I mentioned before, it's got a manual stick shift. So, hey, all good there, too. Um, when you look at all the price ranges, parts, purchase cost, insurance, they're all middle of the range. Um, not really high, not really low, just kind of very manageable. So nothing wrong with that. Um, I did find it a little surprising because, of course, uh, European cars do have that perceived image of uh, higher costs when operating and uh, when uh, purchasing, which overall actually is true. I'm not going to deny that, but this car actually was very manageable. Um, so aside from the rarity of the car itself, um, the only thing that holds it back is its weight, which is uh, it is a bit of a heavier car on the list. Um so that, especially if you get the four cylinder, it just kind of hampers the performance a little bit, but not too bad. Still very manageable overall. And for that, it may. All right. This is the second cheat car. This is car number 12. So as, as I mentioned before, with the Impala, I divided that into two because it is vastly different cars. The G8, though, 
is a different thing altogether. I had to include it. Um, let's face it. It is technically the eighth generation Grand Prix, right? You know, G8, Grand Prix 8, eighth generation. <laughs> that's that's kind of where the name came from. Um, as one of the last Pontiacs to hold the line until the company was, uh, was ended, um, it's definitely one that kind of rings true for the Grand Prix owners. And a lot of Grand Prix owners I know when the car is ending... Um, Oh, sorry, when their Grand Prix is ending, they look to the G8 as their next car. Um, it's unfortunate, too, because it only really had two production years, 2008 and 2009, and it never really got to see the success it should have been. But the car does not fit some of the rules I've set out for, and that's why it's kind of a cheap car. Uh, primarily the age. Um, it is, uh, obviously, I was looking at 2012 to 2014. These are 2008 to 2009. Much older. Um so know that if you're buying this car, you're getting a car that's going to be at least 10 years old. Um, even though it did not get to ride off into the sunset as a success as it should have had as a Pontiac uh, enthusiast, it was still a great car. It had an awesome V6 engine, and it had optional V8s, which were awesome engines as well. And power ranges were anywhere from 255 horsepower to 415 horsepower, depending on the trim the model year, things like that. So <laughs> tons of horsepower either way, tons of torque. Um, because of its age, it is the cheapest to purchase. Cheaper than the, the Mazda 6, actually. Um, but that's because only because it's an older car. Insurance rates are decent, and parts costs are kind of mid-range. Uh, going with some affordability, there are some things that are a little higher, some are a little lower, but overall, very affordable. Um, the only thing that was really tricky for me for this car as well was getting a proper lockdown on the insurance rates. I couldn't get a proper quote that reflected the car, and I have a feeling it's going to be higher than some of the cars, just uh, just based on the model, the rarity, things like that. But that's just a speculation. I don't know for sure. Um, there's also a few other problems here too. Um, because it's older and dated, it can be uh, prone to age-related issues from repair and maintenance standpoints. You know, things can start failing. Things are going to start going wrong. It is 10, 9 or 10 years old, right? Um, also, as I hate much as I hate to say it from Pontiac G8 owners, uh, G8 owners um, as a 10-year-old car, you don't know how someone drove this rear-wheel drive beasts. Um, you know, people love to do their burnouts. They love to do uh, hard acceleration on it. Um, so we don't know what the condition is when you're buying it. You don't know how it's been handled, if it's been driven nicely or it's been mishandled and you need a new differential at some point. Um, you really don't know. It's either, I find when I look at the G8s, one of the G8s I could find, it was one side or the other. It's either one, people were really hard on them and beat the holy hell out of them. Or two, they were meticulous and they maintained them and they were immaculate. So you're really getting one or the other. Um, now, also, because it only had two uh, two years of product run, and, and in that product run, they didn't sell very much, they are extremely hard to find. Um, so, and then finally, actually adding to that, the V6 is the one I did see, the ones I could find. Finding a V8 was damn near impossible. So, uh, know that when you're looking at, if you're looking at this car, that's what you're looking at. But, let's be honest, you're getting a big, huge, powerful sedan, tons of room, amazing styling, and the spirit of the Grand Prix is still present in the car, for me, that car is one to consider without a doubt. I think that I nail the list. Does the cars kind of match up, look good, choices are good? Or do you dispute some of them, think some of them are really stupid and there's some better ones you have? Whatever it is, leave it in the comments below. Let me know if there's cars that you have uh, chosen or things you're thinking about. Make sure to leave that in the comments. Or if there's cars on this list that you really don't agree with, let me know why. Um, I hope the video has been helpful. It's just kind of a fun little video to put together just uh, to see what, just on my opinion, what I would get just based on some of the research criteria I did. So hopefully it's uh, at least giving you guys something to think about. Also, this is a new format of video. Obviously, all my videos are as a mechanical work or how to fix something, how to maintain something, anything like that. Um, so let me know what you thought of the format, if it works, if it doesn't work, if there's something is better, something is worse. Again, I, I'm always trying to make the content better, you know that. So if you do dislike it or anything like that, let me know why. But if you do like it, let me know that too. Make sure to subscribe if you're brand new to the channel. Other than that, I want to thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next video.